Any person at this time must wear a face mask. Um, is there anyone here that's recording the meeting? Please disclose to the chair at this time. Channel 5, anybody else? Channel 8, anyone else recording the meeting? Okay, thank you. Superintendent will call the roll. Yes. And uh, Mrs. Sal Jamal? Present. Mrs. Coleman? Present. Ms. Donnelly? Present. Mr. Frasica? Present. Mrs. Gately? Present. Mr. Torello? Present. Mayor McCarthy? Present. All rise, please. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now, we will now come into the Community Speaks public input part. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address the school committee? You have to be a Waltham resident, and we'll limit it to 15 minutes for the whole thing. It's up to the chair whether we go beyond that. So please line up if you wish to address the school committee. Okay, is there something up there? Marion, I mean, uh, Andrea? Okay, good. Okay, please state your name. My name is Melissa Emery Aris. And I'm a mother of a Waltham um, high school student. And I am, I'm just like heartbroken that this is happening because just thinking about liberty and justice for all and thinking about the fact that people are trying to attack our students and um, and the fact that we even have to come here is just crazy to me. Like I just, I, I, I am firmly in support of keeping these books. I'm firmly in support of protecting our students and helping them grow into the people that they are going to be. I see this whole attack on the books as an effort to undermine a vulnerable population. And the fact that we're even having this meeting seems discriminatory to me. Um, so I am just hoping and begging that Waltham can be better, because this is not better. So please, please keep the books. Thank you. Okay. I'm very sorry. They have the right, once I acknowledge them, they have the right. But you're taking away from their time, so please refrain from clapping. Thank you. Deanna Venaria. I'm 55 Ivy Lane. Good evening, members of the school committee, and thank you for allowing me to speak. I am one of many parents that are here tonight to express how absolutely furious we are to learn about a book that has been made available to Waltham students. The name of the book is Gender Queer. Before I talk about this book, let me make myself loud and crystal clear. I support the LGBT community. I am not a bigot. Please. Please, please. I need, everybody will have a chance. I need to have, once I give up the opportunity to speak, we have to be respectful. Thank you. And I am not here tonight to spread hatred. I'm here to talk about a book that does not belong on the shelves of the Waltham High School. Gender Queer is a story about one's journey of self-identity. It offers erotic pictures in a comic book setting. These pictures display two individuals which appear to be boys, performing both oral and penetrative sex. This book contains child pornography. Not even a warning label on the book itself is acceptable. Mass General Law, Section 29, Whoever distributes any matter which is obscene, knowing it to be obscene, or whoever has in his possession any matter which is obscene, knowing it to be obscene, with the intent to distribute the same, shall be punished by imprisonment in the state prison for not more than five years, or in a jailhouse or correction for not more than two and a half years, or by a fine not less than 1,000 nor more than 10,000 for the offense. Federal law prohibits the distribution of obscene matter to minors, any transfer 
or attempt to transfer to a minor is punishable to a minor. The law clearly states these pictures are not acceptable to be viewed by any teenager. Therefore, it does not belong in our schools. We demand to know all parties who approve this book to enter the library. Anyone part of that approval process should resign from their position. Any parties such as librarians that have the book hidden away so students can still see them should resign. The principal who we trust and should make the right decisions for our child's best interest has failed. Education is about a child's identity. In relation to gender is not part of school's curriculum. Stop trying to sexualize our children. The human brain does not completely mature until 25. These kids have enough to worry about than having to question their identity. No child should have to worry about that. There are, many, there are many other subjects that I would like to discuss but are not on the agenda for tonight's meeting. Next meeting, I would like to request that the following subjects be heard. Why are students being divided by race instead of as a whole? How many sexual altercations have happened at the high school and are not reported to parents? Why do our teachers feel like they have no voice? If they speak, they fear to lose their job. I am at this microphone tonight in support of over 25 teachers that have no voice and rely on people like myself to speak. Why does the principal allow students to use foul language and disrespect teachers? When you're, when you're a principal, that is your school, not the students. They are in your house, not theirs. They are there to learn values, not strip them from others. If you can't handle the position of being a leader and start running a tight ship, then this is not the job for you. Our taxes do not pay for you to run a social club. Our children are there to learn, just like we did. As I conclude, I would also like to know why Mr. Tarallo continuously objected to let Renee Arena speak last week. When on the committee, when the committee scuffled to try to find a way to allow her to speak, you did not let her. You did not find a way. Why? I also want to make one more comment that is not on this. I do notice tonight that our principal in this school is wearing a rainbow mask. That's great. Which I, which I fully support. But as a principal, she should not have that mask on. She should be neutral. She should be here for our kids as well. All kids. All kids. Okay. And we can see the maturity here, so I'm going to end it at that. Mark, no, Mark, it's very immature. Mark, there's no engaging with each other. Respectfully, the community speaks is a novel thing that came in in the 1980s. Please respect it. It's important that we hear from all, all sides. I'm going to go beyond the 15 minutes to make sure everybody that wants to be heard will be. Name, please. Renee Arena, 20 Browns Avenue. Thank you, and I appreciate the library committee taking the time to look at genderqueer and this book is gay, even though I do not agree with, agree with their decision. Because even if the books aren't available at the school, they are freely available at the public library and at bookstores. And if you're going to allow these books, I just wonder why you aren't allowing other things like, I don't know, Playboy? Um, I hear their article's good, just put a sticker on it. Um, Playboy, Hustler, Pornhub. I've recently been accused of anti-intellectualism by some people who work at the Waltham Public Schools. And these books are a quick read, very fast, really below grade level for uh, high school grade level. In the back of the, this book is gay, is only a short list of the gay icons, people people who only get a line or two of acknowledgement, some people of great achievement, some people like Alan Turing, he only got two lines in here. 
There's only a very, sh very short list. But when it comes to other stuff, when it comes to the graphic, when it comes to graphic depictions or, or um, graphic depictions or, or, or descriptions of sex, that gets a lot more. But Alan Turing is a hero for his, for his work in computer science and in code breaking at Bletchley Park. But the book devotes, devotes pages and pages, as I said, to graphic sexual descriptions, but only two lines to people like him. So if you want intellectualism, then how about, putting, how about having a book on Alan Turing in the library instead of having books like this? This is not about hate. This is not about hate. These are books that, that, should, not be, that should not be in a place that specifically caters to people under 18. The school needs to go back to be about the three R's and leave the rest of us, to the, leave the rest of it to the parents. We are the experts on our kids, not the teachers, not the schools, not DESE, it's us. And parents, you have to stand up now. It's scary, yes. And while I have, while I have received support for this, I, I'm a middle-aged woman of Canadian First, First Nations ancestry and, ha, and I have been on the receiving end of a lot of intolerance by those who profess tolerance and because I am not of the type of diversity that they want, because I have a diversity of opinion. But if I can do it, so can you. It's time to be a lion, not a sheep. Thank you very much. No clapping, please. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Rachel Hershon. I live at 329 Lincoln Street. Um, I'm going to be addressing two agenda items tonight, the lengthening of the mask mandate in schools and um, the current attack on students' intellectual freedom. Um, so I normally do not get involved in local politics, um, but as I tell my students, you can't complain about something if you're not willing to make the effort to change or fix it. So I am here to do that tonight. I recognize that many parents argue that mask wearing negatively impacts our students. However, I would like to argue that the mask wearing itself is not the issue, but the fact that students were closed off in their homes for about a year and a half. This should be obvious. It is undeniable that the lack of socialization would cause the behavioral and mental health concerns we are seeing now, not masks. A piece of fabric or paper to cover someone's mouth and nose cannot possibly contribute to issues surrounding emotional health. The argument just does not make sense. If anything, through this pandemic, mask wearing has probably been the easiest thing to do. It requires minimal effort and it keeps others safe. Think about the amount of students who live with grandparents or siblings under five years of age. How do you think it would impact their mental health to lose a family member because they brought COVID home? Easily preventable with lengthening the mask mandate. Our population of students and their families have an incredibly low vaccination rate. 56% at my school McDevitt to be exact. What has made the limit of school-wide spread so effective is our current mask mandate. We have seen through parent-sponsored super spreader events, like the parent-hosted winter formal in December, that certain families cannot be trusted to take effective measures in the face of a global epidemic. This caused community spread right before the holidays, which subsequently branched out to siblings at other schools and their families. Mask wearing at school in the face of this event led to minimal transmission within the buildings. If a family decides to hold another super spreader event, such as this one, the attendees and their families will most certainly be affected. Hey. However, the spread to other students, faculty, and staff who are uninvolved will be reduced or prevented with mask wearing in schools. The whole community should not have to take the hit because of an irresponsible few. As a teacher, I have a right to work in an environment in which my safety is prioritized along with the safety of my students. So much has been demanded of us this school year. I have been teaching for the Waltham Public Schools for the past four years now, and this has been the most taxing year thus far. Somehow we are expected to catch students up, teach new material that they do not have the skills yet to access, and incorporate social emotional learning to make up for the mental health issues and trauma caused by the pandemic. And on top of all of that, we are expected to keep our students physically safe in poorly ventilated buildings and classrooms where appropriate distancing is not always possible. 
At the very least, safety should be uh, put into consideration by lengthening our mask mandate. Moreover, there is a massive shortage of both regular teachers and substitutes. This decision could put an even bigger strain on schools to find coverage and a strain on your child's education by not having their teachers readily available to them due to teacher illness. This year of teaching has been exhausting, both physically and emotionally. I know I have many colleagues who feel similarly. Curtailing this mask mandate sends a message to teachers that the community does not appreciate their service by ignoring their safety. Politicizing an issue of basic safety and disease prevention shows us that members of the community care more about pushing their beliefs than adhering to facts and research. My colleagues and I have gone above and beyond to serve this community and its incredible population of students and family. Our safety deserves to be put into account. Finally, to the members of the community who want to censor stories in our libraries about LGBTQ characters, just because you personally do not understand the lived experiences of LGBTQ youth, it is not your job to police what students can and can't read. Imagine the lifeline that these books provide to students who are dealing with the same issues. As ELA teachers, it is our job to select books that are both windows and mirrors. Windows for students to look out and learn about the experiences of others so they can become empathetic, upstanding citizens. And mirrors for students to find themselves reflected back in stories, to know that their stories matter. According to a recent article published in Forbes, nearly 42% of LGBTQ youth have attempted or considered attempting suicide. Representation matters, and to have uplifting stories that reflect students' experiences matter. Just because many of you haven't personally experienced this does not mean that it doesn't happen here. As a public school, it is our job to educate students about multiple worldviews and experiences, not just the ones that you personally find acceptable or palatable. We are not a community that believes in exclusion and intolerance. You, the Waltham Schools Committee, must take a vocal stand against <laughs> censorship and bigotry. Censoring certain authors or topics sets a dangerous precedent. As we've seen throughout history and in many other states currently, we cannot possibly say that we are a district that takes an anti-racist stance when we start to censor the voices of marginalized communities. Trust the expertise of your teachers. We work tirelessly to create school environments founded on inclusivity. We want the best for our students. And that means providing texts that can help them navigate the challenges that may, they may be faced with or the challenges of other members of the community. Thank you. Okay, next please. Please, please. Hi, Christy Hanley, 62 Candlewood Drive. I'm a mother of two Waltham High School students. I'm also a library teacher in Waltham. And I can tell you this issue of banning or challenging books is not just happening here, it's happening across the country. And according to the American Library Association, school and public libraries are reporting an unprecedented increase in the number of book challenges all across the country. The most, challenges, the most challenged books include themes of racial justice, stories centered around BIPOC and LGBTQ plus content. Pulling titles that deal with these difficult subjects can make it harder for students, teachers, and parents to discuss these issues. By pulling these titles, we are destroying the possibility to have these tough conversations. Removing books featuring LGBTQ plus characters and books dealing with racism is harmful to students who may already feel that they are in the minority. It's a sad fact that their experiences are extremely underrepresented in literature. In addition to students needing to see themselves represented in literature, they also need books that are windows into others' lives. Here in Waltham, we're fortunate to have many certified professional librarians in our schools. I think our team is exceptional. We carefully and purposefully choose which books make it into the library. We carefully and purposefully choose our curriculum. It is worth noting that librarians, whether school or public, we do not make these decisions alone. There are numerous professional associations that have official policies 
regarding a number of issues, including the freedom to read. I'd ha they have several propositions in the freedom to read. I'd like to highlight one that is currently affirmed by the American Library Association. It's the responsibility of publishers and librarians as guardians of the people's freedom to read to contest encroachments upon that freedom by individuals or groups seeking to impose their own standards or tastes upon the community at large. To parents who are asking for books to be pulled from our libraries, I'd first say that I think it's excellent that you are taking an interest in what your children are reading and what your child is learning. But before you ask for a book to be banned, please read it first. Your opinion may very well change after viewing that work as a whole. I'd also say to parents, you can absolutely tell your own child that they are not allowed to read a particular book. But nobody has the right to keep anyone else's child from accessing literature that they want or need to read. Hi. Um, hi, my name is Elise. I'm a freshman at Waltham High School. I'm also a proud member of the queer community. Honestly, it's disturbing to me that this hearing is even taking place. I feel as though comfort for queer youths is often overlooked or outright diminished by people who do not understand queer struggle or identity. These books are not threatening to students, regardless of gender or sexual identity, gay, straight, cisgender, or transgender. These books offer a necessary perspective that helps us expand and connect with one another's differences, struggles, and selves. The books, while sexually explicit, do not fall into miseducation or pornography that could be found by research outside of school. These books offer a safe, informal look at queer experience. Frankly, I would be extremely disturbed if these books were removed from the school library as it feels as though it would be banning queer experience and discussion. There is no room in the school for bigotry or censorship, and this sets a dangerous precedent on censorship on LGBTQ content. If these books are to be removed, my comfort and the comfort of other students would be jeopardized. Thank you. Hi, Arielle Traeger, 205 Lowell Street. Um, I speak tonight as a Waltham resident. I'm also an English teacher at Waltham High School, and I speak to beliefs that are shared by my colleagues in the English department. Uh, regardless of the supposed reasons for challenging these books, if these particular books were to be removed from the library, it would send a message to our LGBTQ students that it's not okay to be who they are. Schools are held as safe spaces for students to explore ideas as they forge their identities, both as individuals and members of a community. Libraries and the books in them are an integral part of the process and must remain an open resource that accurately reflects the diversity of the world the students exist in. LGBTQ students deserve educational materials and they deserve books that depict happy and healthy LGBTQ characters who have navigated the same struggles as them. Removing resources from our library would send a message to all students that it is not a safe and productive space for their inquiries and could possibly send them to other less safe spaces to explore their questions. Furthermore, libraries operate on the freedom of choice. That materials are made available does not mean that students are mandated, obligated, or in any other way influenced to select them. As stated in the American Library Association's interpretation of the Library Bill of Rights, Quote, libraries should not limit the selection and development of library resources simply because minors will have access to them. A library's failure to, require, to acquire materials on the grounds that minors may be able to access those materials diminishes the credibility of the library in the community and restricts access for all library users. Children and young adults unquestionably possess First Amendment rights, including the right to receive information through the library in print, sound, images, data, social media, online applications, games, technologies, programming, and other formats. Constitutionally protected speech cannot be suppressed solely to protect children or young adults from ideas or images a legislative body believes to be unsuitable for them." End quote. Finally, removing texts which, which target the LGBTQIA community may open the door to other identity 
sorry, may open the door for other identity groups who have been marginalized in our community to have their voices silenced and their identities essentially banned as well. Do not approve this ban, ban and set precedent for the future marginalization of our students. The city of Waltham does not want to be in the national news tomorrow for banning books. It is the school committee's job to support and promote the education of all students. Do not choose to limit the education of our students. Hi, my name is Janice Alpert. I live at 99 Warwick Avenue. Um, I'm glad Ms. Pena is wearing a rainbow mask. I don't know where she is, but when I saw that, that made me very happy, and she's a wonderful principal. Um, I have a freshman at Waltham High, and I have a seventh grader at Kennedy. And I'm a library media specialist in another district. Um, I strongly oppose the removal of these titles and any other materials which have been carefully selected for the school libraries. I want books in my children's school libraries to serve as mirrors to reflect their own lives as well as windows into other people's experiences. Recent research conducted by the Trevor Project, an LGBTQ youth suicide prevention and crisis intervention organization, has shown that increased acceptance and affirmation can significantly reduce risk to stu can, excuse me, significantly reduce risk. The LGBTQ students need to have these books. Books like these could quite literally save their lives. I want my children to have access to voices from all communities. Now, pulling out a few images or passages from a book does not explain the context in which the words were written or the images were intended. I saw the initial images that were sent and then I read the whole book and saw the, saw the context. Um, I wonder if the person or group even read the books in full. And I also wonder why anybody should get to dictate what my children have access to in their school library. I trust the Waltham School Library staff to use their selection policies and knowledge of literature and young adults to purchase materials for their schools. Book challenging and banning is a slippery and very dangerous slope. It violates the First Amendment and the Library Bill of Rights. My seventh grader just finished reading The Giver in English class, and in the words of Lois Lowry, submitting to censorship is to enter the seductive world of The Giver, the world where there are no bad words and no bad deeds, but it is also the world where choice has been taken away and reality distorted, and that is the most dangerous world of all. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Trisha O'Connell. I live at 84 Ellery Road in Waltham. And I just learned tonight about this meeting. I don't have anything prepared and I won't be as eloquent as the people who came before me. But I have two sons in the Waltham Public Schools. One is in middle school at McDevitt and one is at Waltham High School. One is straight and one is not straight. And I love them equally and I am proud of them as equally. The fact that we're here, even discussing this in this day and age, is mind blowing to me. I want to reiterate how difficult it is to be a child, even in this day and age, who feels different. And everybody in this room has felt different and less than at some point in their lives. And for kids who are LGBTQ, that's multiplied by many thousands. So I want my son and my son who's straight to have books that show them about the gay experience, the lesbian experience, the whatever other experience there is. They need to learn it. And to those who said that it's not educational, there are plenty of books in the library that are not traditionally educational. You can find magazines that aren't educational. You can find books. So some of it is lofty, but one of the books that is trying to be censored is called, um, as I understand it, this book is gay. And what the review of that on Amazon says is inside, you'll find the answers to all the questions you ever wanted to ask with topics like stereotypes, the fact and fiction, coming out as LGBT, where to meet people like you, 
the ins and outs of gay sex, stereotypes, the facts, sorry, I said that, and how to flirt, and so much more. That sounds like something that anybody who's trying to come to terms with their sexual identity needs to look at. And my generation, we didn't have books like this. You didn't have something to turn to and figure out that there were other kids like you. And it is not time to force them back into the closet and take away books that make you uncomfortable. And I'm sure there are people sitting here said, well, the fact that they talk that about the in, ins and outs of gay sex, that shouldn't be in the library. Well, the reality is you will find books in the Waltham Public Libraries about, or school libraries about sexuality and heterosexual um, intercourse. There's no question about that. And there should be, because it's human sexuality, it's health. It has to be there. These kids, keeping them in a vacuum and acting like this doesn't happen, it's just, it's nonsensical. And I reiterate what the person before me said, and that this is a really slippery slope that we're getting into. Because there are books in the library now, I'm sure, in Waltham High School Library, or in the middle school library, that wouldn't have been acceptable that long ago. Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence, that's risque. Tropic of Cancer by Henry Miller, that's another. The list could go on and on. The reality is, until not that long ago, people thought that interracial marriage was unacceptable and, and unnatural. Should, if there are people who still feel that way, should those books be out? Where's the line? The Bible talks about putting women in a different room during certain parts of their cycle and stoning, stoning for adultery. I'm not in favor of adultery. I don't think many people here are, but is the Bible gonna give the readers ideas that maybe we should go out and stone people? If your children are that malleable to outside influence, perhaps the issue is that you're not doing your job. I want to end by thanking the school committee and the mayor for all the support. Waltham is a very inclusive community. It has a beautiful array of colors, ethnicities, political persuasions, nationalities, genders, and sexual identities, and we should celebrate them all and not make some kids feel lesser. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Sony Patel, and I'm a sophomore of Waltham High. I am a queer teen of color, and it is nearly impossible to find any representation at all in media and society around me. Most importantly, this representation lies in sex ed. We were taught sex ed in middle school, most importantly intercourse, and how to stay safe during it. But this never touched on any gay sex, male gay sex, lesbian sex, any of it. It's so important that teens stay safe during, when having sex because newsflash, teens have sex in high school. It's happened, it's gonna happen, it's inevitable. And the more we ignore it, the more dangerous it could become. There was once a book at the Scholastic Book Fair with a woman with breasts out as she, a woman with breasts out as she was bull drying her hair. This book was, clearly to teach on the health of how girls get ready, clean themselves, etc. And now no one ever complained about it because it was obviously about to teach the health on how to take care of yourself. So why is sex any different? Why there's a reason that people did not have an outrage over this book. And it was because that the context obviously meant that hey, this book is about health. It's about how to take care of yourself. And sex is no different. Sex has literally no difference. It is health. It is a way to stay safe during it. And if you don't tell people how to stay safe, then they're gonna go through more dangerous ways, especially minors and how vulnerable they are. They're gonna find dangerous ways to go through with acts of intercourse and it could end really badly. And I know some of my friends that have done things that they probably shouldn't have just because they weren't educated on it or there weren't books around them to help them. And yeah, maybe you have the big idea that I'm not a bigot. I just don't want my kids viewing this book because it has intercourse. And yeah, I'm, I don't hate gay people. No, you just want them to appear as straight as possible. You don't want them kissing another woman. You don't, don't want a guy kissing another guy. You just want them to exist without showing any of their queerness, but their queerness is who they are. Thank you.
Hello. I am Minal Kafaji. I am a junior at Waltham High School. Today I came to talk about the mask mandate, but I do want to touch a little bit about the books. A lot of people use Christianity as an excuse for being, for being against the LGBT community. So I'm a Muslim, let's play the Bible game, okay? In Islam, it is a sin to be a part of the LGBT community. Yes, it is. But it is a bigger sin to judge and to treat those people less than what I am. And if you want to talk about sins in Christianity, why do you drink? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? If you want to follow every rule, let's follow every rule, okay? Now I'm going to get to what I actually came here for. <laughs> so sorry. The mask mandate. It's really funny because before coming here, I was warned. Um, <laughs> I was warned from the many adults that actually believe they're being oppressed just because of a cloth on their face. There's a lot of misconceptions that, I don't know, maybe they, they'll, that causes them to believe they're being oppressed, but that's okay. The misconceptions between the vaccine and the mask. The vaccine was created to decrease hospitalization and death rates in the hospital. The mask is compatible with the vaccine. If you do not wear your mask, the, vac the virus will come into your body. But if there's, an ins when, if there's a case where the virus does come inside your body, the vaccine is there to protect you from going inside the hospital. And we cannot be that progressive that we can't put a piece of cloth on our face. We can't move on. We have, have, we've dealt with this. I've dealt with this since my freshman year. I'm graduating next year. I haven't had a real full year of school. And I think, honestly, we could have done better. We really could have. It was so easy. And if we look at the graphs of COVID cases from the beginning till now, we will see it in wavelengths. It increases, then it decreases. It increases, then it decreases. And it will stay like that for a really long time if we don't do the right thing. And a lot of people like to compare the flu to COVID, I mean the COVID to flu. I'm not gonna get into the science of it because that'll take a long time, but they are very different from each other. And the people that complain, why can't we have homecoming? Why can't we have prom? Why can't I go to a restaurant and not have to show my vaccine card? Well, if you do the right thing, you could do all of the above. And we already have a lot of problems inside the school because, oh, this person's not wearing their mask right. I'm gonna judge this person because they're wearing the mask right, or why do you think like this? Re uh, shortening the mask mandate will increase that tension even more between the students and the teachers. It will create an awkward tension. And me, even now, I honestly despise walking into that school sometimes. I don't feel safe in a lot of classrooms. There are many times where I had to personally walk up to the teacher and to explain to them, I do not feel comfortable inside your classroom because you are not enforcing this rule. If I get sick, I will blame it on the administration. They have claimed that they will put consequences on kids that don't follow the rules, but nothing, no action has been taken. And I understand, everybody has their rights. Everybody does have their right, and you can do whatever you want with your body, yes. But if your actions affect my life, I have to deal with the consequences even though I'm following the rules. That is why I'm passionate. A lot of people say, why do you care? If you're wearing a mask and I'm not wearing a mask, you're not gonna get COVID because you're protecting yourself. Well, if you don't wear a mask and you don't wear a mask and you don't wear a mask, COVID cases will increase and then I will have to go back online and my life will be destroyed again. So, thank you. Hello, my name is Jessica Arcetti, and I am a senior at Walton High School here to speak on the subject of the challenge books. Thank you to the school committee and to the mayor for allowing myself and my fellow students to defend our right to our books. Our students are not unaccustomed to feeling unheard when it comes to what we are allowed to know and read. 
but we have no desire to let that continue. I have read Genderqueer. My friends and classmates have read Genderqueer and this book is gay. None of us were disturbed, distressed, or corrupted. This book discusses uncomfortable themes having to do with sex, gender, and healthcare. I understand the desire to protect students from discomfort. I believe that is the only reason why anyone would want to ban a book. But I implore you to understand that this protection will only drive a rift between students and adults. We are not so young that we need to be denied information for our well-being. The best way you can help us is by giving us the resources we need to learn about ourselves. Our bodies are not inappropriate. Neither are the bodies of our transgender and non-binary classmates. We all deserve to see ourselves in literature so that we know you care about us. We cannot be cared for if we're put away like dirty secrets. I implore you to think about what students want. I know you're adults and you have experienced things you want to protect us from but we will encounter them one way or another if we want to or not. Ignorance has never been the solution to curiosity. Please show you support us and you will be kind to us if we have deviant or taboo questions. I want to feel safe here. I want to leave this school trusting that my siblings, my classmates, and potentially my children will be protected. Thank you for your compassion and your attention. Hi, my name is Michaela Chikowski and I am a Waltham High School student. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the school committee for letting us speak here today. Um, I wasn't sure I was going to speak here today. I knew I wanted to, of course, as soon as I heard there were people trying to ban books from my school library, and even more once I had read Joda Queer for myself. Many people have warned me that sadly there could be repercussions for me speaking today, if only because this topic is one that many people are passionate about. But I believe it is my duty and all of our duty to speak up for what we believe in, and so I am here today to do that. I'd like to thank you ahead of time for your respect and dedication towards this matter. Books expose us to a variety of ideas, places, and cultures. This is their purpose. Books like Genderqueer and This Book is Gay help people understand themselves and their sexuality and also connect with other people. I have a quote with, from commonsensemedia.org, a tool for multimedia content evaluation for parents. Kids crave relatable books. Banned books often deal with subjects that are realistic, timely, and topical. Young people may find a character going through exactly what they are, which makes it a powerful reading experience and helps the reader sort out thorny issues like grief, divorce, sexual assault, bullying, prejudice, and sexual identity, end quote. Books allow us to show compassion and form our own opinions, as young people will always do, regardless of what we're told to believe. We as a society need to, and a school need to let children and young adults learn about the world around them, because this is our reality. People are different, and we, that is okay. Banning books just because parents don't want to expose students to language, actions, and ideas that contradict their ideologies are more harmful than helpful. It prohibits young adults from learning about things that they will encounter later in life. When students are able to read controversial materials at school, they can have these important and healthy conversations with trusted adults such as teachers and other school community members. These, book help, these books help teach students about lessons while they have a safe place to process and learn. If you don't agree with a topic or a subject in a book, Banning it is not the way to go about making your discontent known, for many reasons. But what should be done? Keep the book. Let young adults make their own conclusions and try to help guide them in these thoughts without forcing your own ideas. Communicate your feelings and let students share their thoughts as well. Next, I would like to look at why LGBTQ plus media in particular is so important. In the past, LGBTQ plus literature was considered scandalous because it was and is taboo to discuss in society. Um, today, over 11% of the population are out as LGBTQ plus and are not equally represented in any form of media, least of all YA and children's media. People in the LGBTQ plus community, like other marginalized communities, don't see themselves represented and thus feel ignored and invalidated. The stance on banning specifically LGBTQ plus media is harmful and reinforces the idea that some thoughts and ideas are more valuable than others. Finally, I would like to look at the criteria for banning a book. 
Court precedent says that a book has to be considered obscene by contemporary community standards or nationally to be banned. Neither gender queer nor this book is gay fit these criteria. However, both fit the criteria to be saved, i.e. a redeeming social and psychological value. In the end, everyone has the right to read about socially contested issues and to feel represented in the school community, our home, our house. Thank you. Hi, I'm Aaliyah. I'm a freshman from this high school, obviously. Um, I don't have much to say because many of the people I know here and who are speaking their piece have already said many things that I agree with. Um, but I think that these books are meant to educate and include students of all identities. There is very little education and importance available to students based around safe sex and the body. Um, like we, even in middle school, we barely got any education surrounding, you know, like, you know, all the gist, all the stuff, you know, like all the stuff that you're supposed to learn about the body to keep yourself safe. And even in high school, I haven't yet learned about that at all. And if we don't learn about this now, we could make serious, serious, seriously bad decisions that could affect us in the future and we wouldn't be able to change that. Um, and I think that these books help give students like their own space where they can connect and thrive based on. Somebody, excuse um, me for one minute. Somebody keeps touching that light. I don't want you to be on, in the dark while they're talking. Oh my God, I'm so Somebody's touching it's it. It's not working, Mayor. Oh, it's fine. They just turned it back on. Yeah, it's not working anymore. Okay, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Like, I think that the, man, that the books, like these books give students, including myself, a safe space to talk about our commonalities, what we think about, what we want to learn about, what we need to have in the future that we can be successful. That's, that's it. Okay, next please. Uh, hi, can, can everyone hear me? Yep. All right, uh, hello. I am Rowan Eliza. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, so I heard about this. My mom told me, and I heard a couple of other rumors around the school that some, a couple of people were trying to repeal several books that spoke around topics of LGBTQI um, problems and issues and information in general and repeal those from the library. And I'm standing here and as a student still learning about things, I'll openly admit I'm not the best at speaking for other people because everyone is so diverse and that's just it. Diversity. It's about learning of things and other people and everything around you. You, if something doesn't apply to you, learn about it. If something applies to you, learn about it. There's no benefit from, oh, there we go. <laughs> there is no benefit to the LGBTQIA plus youth and community by Peeling the information that we need to keep ourselves safe and learn about the environment and life around us. As a writer, and I'll say it, I'm a writer. I've written several stories. I make it a full priority to include representation, whether that's LGBTQI plus or POC. And I do that because it's important. And it's important because people see themselves in stories. If you draw a smiley face, you'll make a story about it. If you draw a car, there's a story, maybe they're driving to work. And if you look at a character written down on a page, and you can either see another person who's going through something you know about, see someone who's going about something you might not know about. 
and most importantly to a lot of youth, which is something that has been taken away or not shown at all, is seeing yourself in those characters. And that is why it's important to allow students to see that representation in books either to see themselves in the books and see their own stories or things they can relate to and things they can do and hey i matter and yeah okay. Okay. hello my name is garcelle flurry i am a senior at waltham high school my pronouns are she hers and I very much do identify as queer. Uh, I even though I know um, this decision is up to the council, I would like to take a second to address all the, make an address to all the parents who have been complaining about these books. When I first heard about the issues around books, specifically pertaining to the LGBTQ plus community, I had a lot of opinions. I was heavily encouraged by my classmates and friends to voice my experience within the LGBTQ plus community today, being the outspoken person that I am and my passion in social justice, and seeing how this did very much make me upset. It was suggested to me to talk about the many struggles of being queer and the importance of having others understand, but why would I do that when you could literally learn about it in all the books you're trying to ban? Let me be clear, I do not care what you all think of me. I don't care if who I am disgusts you. I don't care if I make you uncomfortable. I do not, I'm not about to stand here in front of a bunch of adults and explain why I should be treated like a person, no matter who I'm attracted to. I do not respect what you're doing. I do not sympathize what you're, with your actions that with no matter what intent end up being harmful to me and my community. And the people that have been targets of constant oppression, violence, and discrimination and hate. You saw a book addressing the problems we have and took it as inappropriate. But did you ever consider the inappropriateness behind how people treat our identities? You'd rather ban books from our schools with the labels queer and gay on them while simultaneously allow us to go to a school where those same words are being used in derogatory terms to bully and traumatize its LGBTQ plus students. When you see the nudity of a queer person being portrayed in a book, do you consider the struggle of body dysmorphia being portrayed in that scene or someone who happens to be trans? Or is the first instinct to always hypersexualize a child based on their sexual orientation? Or did the meanings behind them just simply not matter to you that much? Did you ever consider a person having the advantage of being straight and cisgendered, picking it up and learning about our identities and understanding the privilege to not have your sexuality or sexual identity used against you? And I remind you once again, you don't have to like it, you don't have to agree with it, but the least you could do is show the bare minimum of respecting us as people, but not gatekeeping the texts that help us celebrate and understand who we are. And and label us as inappropriate or perverted without giving a second thought to the disadvantages that we have. Stop getting into the business of queer people and trans people when those are communities you are not in. Stop placing your opinions on the way our, our identities are taught. It really isn't, isn't, never has, and never will be your place. And if the concern of something being inappropriate is being seen by your kids most of all, I encourage you to take a good look in the mirror because for some reason I can't help but notice the same parents offended by these labels of gay, queer, trans have kids who still use them but not in ways, but in only in ways that are derogatory and harmful. Queer people exist, trans people exist, they grow up, they go to school, and they live in the world whether we like it or not. They could be your sibling, your friend, or even your own child. Where would, where would you rather them turn to for information? Their school library or the internet where queer relationships are constantly being over-sexualized and uneducational for the LGBTQ plus community? Inevitably, they will have access to both and, and they will utilize both. The internet is a lot less regulated and there is a lot of misinformation and inappropriate content students could be exposed to. 
These books provide more accurate and age appropriate information in, to help students in their curiosity. So the next time you are offended by these books, just think what's more important, my own feelings or another person's safety. Thank you. Hello, residents of Waltham and members of the council. My name is Tegan Swan, and I'm currently a junior here at Waltham High School. I identify not only as a member of the LGBTQ community, but as a non-binary using the singular they, them pronouns. I'm here today not only to speak about the challenging of the books, this book is gay and genderqueer, but to also speak about my experience with the mask mandate. I, as a member of this community, feel as though our voices should, should be heeded and not only taken into consideration, but also respected, as this impacts us most. For those of you who may not know, these books, the books, this book is gay and genderqueer, are books about, about and highlighting the highs and lows of individuals living as members of the LGBTQ community, as well as at times acting as a replacement for our unprovided education. The book in question, Gender Queer, does cover some heavy topics, such as self-harm and suicide. Unfortunately, this is the life and reality of many members of the LGBTQ community. Removing this book is throwing a sheet over the issue rather than allowing people to learn. If this was a book about a person of your own race, class, sexuality, and gender, would there be a different outcome? Would you allow that to be hidden from the people of Waltham? This book shows the real life issues that members of this community face, members that may not have the voice to speak. This voice can help them know they are not alone. In the book, This Book is Gay, is about education about the LGBTQ community. Not only can it help answer your questions, it can also allow you to find where you belong. Gender is not only two boxes. For goodness sake, the sex of a person isn't two boxes. The third box is labeled as intersex, where a person is born with more than one set of human genitalia. Records of this date back centuries. The chapter that is being challenged most is about LGBTQ sex, a topic not covered in the public education system, leaving questioning teens and young adults resorting to Google, which we all know is not really the best of resources for most topics, to figure it out and learn how everything functions, something more accessible for a heterosexual individual to find putting in less effort than a person of homosexuality. For these reasons and more is why we ask as the Gender and Sexuality Alliance, the GSA, are requesting for these books not only to be kept in school libraries, but also public libraries, to be marked with mature content and sensitive content warnings, allowing people to continue educating themselves on not only these topics, but more. If these books make you uncomfortable or any other feeling you do not wish to have, you do have the ability not to read them. However, we ask you to please not take away our resources. On the topic of mask mandates, as I have said, I'm a student at Waltham High. I have been observing the students and patterns of mask behavior in regards to the COVID cases. The highest point of cases was the week of the 24th. In the two days I was comfortable being at school that week, there were over 65 cases recorded. I saw students not wearing masks the week prior However, once the numbers spiked, it was apparent to us students masks would help tremendously with our cases in the building. I believe that the numbers do not lie. The mask mandate should remain in place. If, however, it is decided to lift the mandate, I feel as though the committee should make a plan on reinstating the mandate, or if or when the numbers spike once more. Masks do not only keep us safe from COVID-19, but from more common illnesses, such as the cold, the flu, and strep. Masks, masks moving forward can improve students' attendance due to illness as well. There should also be a plan in place to protect the students who do choose to continue to wear a mask until further notice. We do not know why a student may be choos choosing to wear one. They could live with a grandparent, younger siblings, be immunocompromised, the list goes on. Students should not have to explain their reason for wearing a mask. Thank you. Hello, my name is Katie Cohen and I live on 1054 Trapello Road. 
Um, I am also one of the stewards of the Queer Little Library here in Waltham, which provides, uh, thank you, which provides LGBT and queer books for free to everybody within Waltham. Um, I'm not gonna say much more than what the students have already said because they are amazing and I've said it much better than I can say it myself. But one thing that I will say, speaking as a perspective, uh, from the perspective of somebody who provides these types of books that are trying to be banned or have been suggested of being banned in Waltham, that the books that specifically are being targeted are ones that when they enter the library, they immediately leave. They're ones that people are looking for, are searching for, and need to be out there for people to be able to access easily and be able to um, read and see themselves in it. Especially this book is gay. That's one that when I was younger, I wish that I had. I did not have the resources that exist now when I was younger. They would have helped me become more understanding of who I am as a person now. A lot earlier on, they would have made me feel less alone. And it would have been a helpful resource for people that don't understand when I was coming out to be able to hand it to them, have them have their questions answered so I'm not the one that has to answer them for everybody. I believe that these books are extremely important. I thank the committee for allowing people to speak on this and hearing everybody out on this. I know it's been a long time and there's a lot of people talking, but uh, thank you for listening and thank you for um, allowing us to keep these books within the school. Hi, my name is Josh Kastorf. I live at 33 Everett Street. Thank you to the committee for letting everybody speak. I appreciate that. I'm here to speak on behalf of the group of people who organized last summer the first ever, as far as we know, uh, Waltham Pride event. And all of us are here today. Um, and we just started planning a Pride for this year, so we hope a lot of you can join us. The organizers of Waltham Pride support the recommendation of the review committee to keep the books Gender Queer by Maya Kobabe and This Book is Gay by Juno Dawson in the school library. According to the Trevor Project, as I think other speakers have mentioned, every 45 seconds in the US, an LGBT person between the ages of 13 and 24 attempts suicide. Being a teenager is not easy for anyone, but realizing that the changes you're experiencing are different than the changes your friends are experiencing can lead to the terrifying feeling that you are alone in the world and that you may never be able to live the kind of life you dreamed of when you were a kid. Many of us who survived to become openly queer adults mm -hmm. remember finding the first clues that we were not alone in the world in the pages of a book. Young people today have access to a fire hose of information and attitudes about sexuality and gender on the internet, much of it misleading and potentially harmful. Students who go to the library to look for information on these topics are demonstrating a level of maturity and wisdom that should be rewarded with honest and helpful information. And I think we've seen some of the maturity and wisdom in the students who've spoken tonight. Thank you. Librarians who recognize that need and make the effort to provide appropriate books despite the risk of criticism from some in the community are heroes and may be quite literally saving lives. We are here tonight in part to thank them as well as all of the students, parents, teachers, school employees and members of this committee who have supported them or who have made efforts to keep our schools safe and welcoming for LGBT plus youth. In the past year, as I think other speakers have mentioned, the American Library Association has reported an unprecedented spike in attempts to ban books in America. NBC News called Gender Queer one of the most banned books in this country. Thousands of complaints have been made against books in school libraries, almost entirely books by LGBT authors or authors of color, inspired by a national political trend of claiming these books are obscene or pornographic, often based on drawings taken out of context. Pornography is fairly well-defined in our society and most of these claims are absurd on their face. 
In that context, we cannot accept that the people who made this complaint in Waltham were motivated by concern for the well-being of our youth. In order to jump on the bandwagon of a national political trend, they've taken actions that at best waste the time of this committee, and at worst could do serious harm to queer or questioning youth who are not in a position to stand up for themselves. Some are. These are not the tactics of activists who want to make the world a better place. These are the tactics of bigots and bullies. And we are here today to make it clear that this is not acceptable in Waltham. When people express their values by attempting to ban books, they are showing us that they value ignorance, and that attitude has no place in decisions about education. As queer adults and allies, some of us have spent decades dealing with people who try to restrict our ability to be members of our own families and our own communities by claiming that knowledge of our existence is somehow harmful to children. We will not stand by and watch yet another generation suffer because of, the kind of this kind of prejudice. To all the youth in the Waltham school system who are queer or who are still figuring out who they are, we stand with you. It may seem hard to believe now, but you are not alone in the world and you are not alone in Waltham. There's a queer community here that will continue to organize to make sure Waltham is a safe and welcoming place for everyone. And we hope many of you can join us at this year's Pride. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name's Rex Baker. I live at 144 Main. Um, <clears throat> I'm originally from a town called Dripping Springs, Texas. And I want y'all to remember those three words, Dripping Springs, Texas, as y'all are making your decision about these books. Um, I'm proud to be from Dripping Springs, Texas, because 22 years ago, when a group of concerned parents sent out mailers to the parents of the uh, seniors in the AP English class uh, with a bunch of out of context quotes from an award-winning book, uh, including a bunch of, you know, what, sexually explicit imagery, right? And brought their case to the school board. The school board in Dripping Springs, Texas, <laughs> in the year 2000, decided not to ban that book. And so I'm gonna invoke a little bit of north-south rivalry here, right? <laughs> and ask y'all, please, to follow the example of Dripping Springs, Texas, and to keep these books on the shelves, all right? The other thing I'll say is, 22 years ago, my best friend, who is still my best friend today, I, my best friend is gay. Um, 22 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to stand in front of the school board of Dripping Springs, Texas and say that. I can say that today. I can say that today in Massachusetts. And there's a reason that we live up here now. I've got a, a first grader at the, uh, at the Fitzgerald Elementary School right now. And uh, we feel so blessed, and I will use that word, to live in a community that is so inclusive and diverse. And I think it's just incredibly important uh, for all the reasons that have been so eloquently uh, presented earlier tonight that y'all keep, um, keep these books in circulation. So thank you very much, and uh, good luck. Good evening, Mayor, Superintendent, School Committee. Um, first, on the mask mandate, I understand where some people are coming from, but during this entire pandemic, we put the responsibility of keeping everyone safe on the backs of kids, and I don't think that's the right thing anymore. I think that some people might have other experiences. I have two teenagers who I've watched go through this, and you might not think that wearing masks is detrimental to them, but I watched and experienced it for almost two and a half years, every single day, of what it costs these kids. It's hard to be in a classroom with a teacher and not being able to see their face. And I talk to a lot of kids, and some kids feel differently, but a lot of kids are ready to make a decision to be able to take their masks off if they want to. So I support what the governor and the commissioner of education said was that at the 28th, 
that it would be optional and school districts would need to make their own decisions. And on the book, Gender Queer and You're So Gay, oh, this is so gay. Um, I'm wearing this mask not just because I just support students who are gay, but because I support them too. And a lot of times they don't see people in this community that support them. I read the book and I thought it was moving and educational. And our library staff is incredible here. They work tirelessly to make sure that kids have a safe haven where they feel like they matter and are not marginalized. Kids in high school, a lot of kids feel marginalized and they do an outstanding job of making sure that all kids feel safe there. My own kids spent, my son spent four years eating lunch there every single day and my daughter spent every single day eating lunch in the library. They're outstanding. They care about all the kids in this community and we are lucky to have them here as employees. I would also want to comment on how brave I think a kid has to be to walk up to the front of that library and check out that book. Put yourself in their position for one second, what that must feel like. Not everyone has supportive parents that love them and care about them and will be understanding about their sexuality. That would be wonderful if that was the case, but that's not true. Some kids don't have parents. Some kids are in foster care. Some parents have people have parents who are deceased. But it takes bravery to be able to go up to that desk and be able to take that book out. Just like it was brave of them to stand up here in front of all these people here tonight, a lot of them who they think are judging them, to say proudly that they're queer. I applaud you for your bravery. And I remember when we used to have the readathon at Waltham Public Schools before the pandemic, and kids would spend all night reading in the library, paring down book after book, and coming with one book, which was our one book, one story. And a few years ago, the kids selected All American Boys, which is an outstanding novel, but it had a controversial topic. And when they asked the kids, is the community ready, the school community ready for this? They said, the kids are and the adults are not. And that is the problem. The kids here do not have a problem with that book. Nobody's scrounging through the book look, at the library looking for that book or taking it out because they just want to look at the pictures. They're taking it out because they have real questions about their own sexuality. And I don't think as a straight woman, I have a right to say that that book should not be there. I just don't. So that's all. Thank you. My name is Emily Ronald. I live at 1148 Main Street. I have two boys in Plimpton Elementary. Um, first, briefly regarding the mask mandate, if you do decide to lift it, I encourage you to consider under what circumstances, what positivity rate, what hospital overload, you would reinstate it. Um, given the waves and the variants, I think it's something that needs to be considered. Um, that is, should you choose to lift it. Um, regarding the two books that are being discussed. I'm not only comfortable with my kids reading these books, I might end up buying my own copies and sharing them around. Um, I trust our school librarians and teachers to choose high quality appropriate books about LGBTQ people. When I was in high school, gay and queer were primarily insults. Those of us in my classes who weren't straight, including myself, kept it as secret as possible, sharing information through rumors and whisper networks. And if you can't say who you are out loud, you're vulnerable. Not just not knowing about safe sex, but about what a healthy relationship looks like, about what respectful sexual be behavior means, and what it might mean to grow up and be part of society as a queer person. There's so many questions that are left unanswered. In that world, the normal view was that non-heterosexuality was only about sex, unsafe sex, dangerous sex, not love or caring or identity. And that view flattened us. It made all of our conflicting emotions and joys and struggles and arguments into nothing but prurient interest. 
And that same association that gender queer identity, LGBTQ issues are about obscenity, that underlies the claim that these books should be removed because they have sexual content. But these books are not pornography. They're kind, they're thoughtful, and they're a critical need, not just for queer kids who are trying to figure out what a healthy and loving life looks like, but for straight kids who are figuring out all the differences in the world around them, who want to have empathy for people of different sexualities. And to call these books pornographic is to perform that same flattening out to say that LGBTQ identity is just about sex. Even the books themselves talk about how important books are in a school library. <laughs> Gender Queer's protagonist talks about how the school library had characters that resonated with air life. And this book is gay, in chapter five, points out how acceptance has changed. Quote, even a book like this would have been unthinkable 10 years ago. It's cray, a book, like, a book about you in a school library? What next? So I urge you to support the school librarian's choices to ensure that these books remain available to Waltham High Schoolers. Thank you for your service on this committee. Uh, hello, my name is Charles Peterson. I live at 696 Lexington Street, and I had not planned to say anything until I heard some unscientific comments made about masks. I am a retired scientist. The information I get was from Dr. Robert Malone that I've seen interviewed. He is the inventor of mRNA technology. And he is, because of the culture recently, he seems to have been banned by Facebook, banned by Twitter, and some other legacy media. But I know from my fact my wife works in biotech and I'm some of her friends, what he is saying is the truth. So first, a couple comments. One, masks. Do you know how many people know what the 95 means in N95 masks? Do you know? You do know, okay. It means 95% of particles greater than 0.3 microns are blocked from passing through the mask, either into the person wearing it or out from the person who's wearing it. That means 5% of the particles do pass through, 0.3 microns. COVID is half that size. The pores and other cloth masks are three or four times as large. This means that trying to use a mask to stop the transmission of COVID is like using a chain link fence to stop mosquitoes. That is a valid analogy. So people who think that you're killing somebody by wearing a mask or not wearing a mask are off completely wrong in terms of science. That's wrong. Masks do not do this. That, what I just described is theory. Now let's talk about practice. In Denmark, a test was made in 2020, a trial found the mask had no effect on COVID. On Paris Island, the Marines, using military discipline, found the mask had no effect on the transmission of COVID. In August of 2020, the Great Barrington Declaration said the same. This was eventually signed by 16,000 scientists, which the legacy media, some of them have said, were fringe. I don't think so. They said two things. Masks don't stop COVID, and lockdowns would not work. John Hopkins recently said regarding lockdowns that they only had an effect of 0.2% in reducing instances of COVID. You take the vulnerable people away, older people like myself, keep them away, the younger people aren't as affected as much. But now getting back quick to the vaccines. The vaccines worked very well when they first came out. This is Dr. Robert Malone, the inventor of mRNA technology speaking. Sometime in July or August, the mRNA vaccines that he laid the foundation of, the first generation for the alpha variant, the legacy variant, stopped working. The delta variant was a result of the success of the mRNA vaccine. It worked. So the vaccine, so, so, the, so the, the pathogen, the COVID pathogen had a variant that went around it. So people who had, uh, the, the, who had uh, uh, the Delta variant was infecting breakthrough everywhere. Then later on to try to contract some of this, you had the Omega. By the way, one thing about the vaccine, people who got the Delta variant when they got sick were protected from going to the ICU by, uh, by, by the vaccine. 
But one thing I should mention is so as a principle here that's happened throughout this, going from alpha to delta to Omicron, is Muller's ratchet, which you can all look up. Muller's ratchet. There aren't many principles that work regarding uh, pandemics, but Muller's ratchet is one of them. As a pandemic progresses, the pathogen becomes more infectious and less deadly. That has happened. Now, in mid-December, Rob, uh, uh, Robert Malone made the following prediction regarding Omicron. He said, there would be a huge peak, unprecedentedly high peak, that would, be, uh, that would occur, in mid, uh, and it would peak somewhere in, in mid-January. Then it would fall just as fast as it rose. And then it would change from a pandemic to endemic. This will happen no matter what any state does issuing mask or vaccine mandates. The, va the virus is going to do what it's going to do. No state action or intervention will stop that. By the way, fun fact, this is virus is not going away no matter what you do. 80% of white-tailed deer have antibodies in their system for COVID. <laughs> fun fact, it's not going anywhere, it's in the environment. It's everywhere. There were some diseases that only affect humans. COVID is not one of them. A cat can get it, gorillas get it. And as you know, of course, bats get it. Oh, by the way, they had a hard job uh, infecting bats recently, I heard. Strange. Okay, that's all I had to say. Uh, my name is David Ananian. I've lived in Waltham my whole life. Um, I'm not going to talk about the first subject because I'm not educated on it. Um, and maybe some of you should have taken that when you talked about the second subject. Because if you're not educated about something, you shouldn't speak about it. The only person I've heard tonight that has anything of actual knowledge was the gentleman who just spoke. I work in the biodefense industry for Boston University. The masks you're all wearing are not doing anything. You could think they are, and maybe that helps you, and that's fine if you want to wear it. It doesn't help you. Okay, the people that are wearing it, 90% of you are not wearing it correctly. I'm walking around, everybody's touching it. Everybody's breathing it, it's a filter. You're, you're touching a dirty filter. You're better off not having it. It builds, you, you're, you watch these kids that go to class. Actually, I've been tested over 300 times. I'm fully vaccinated, all of it. You have these kids that are all eating in the lunchroom together. When they're eating, they take their masks off. Whether they put it on the table, they put it on their neck. They're not throwing it out and getting a new one. It's they're all sitting there. Sir. What's that? It is required to Please. So, no debate. These kids are eating with their masks. When they get out of school. Oh, you can get up and, excuse me, sir. Yeah. You can get up and speak if you wish to speak. You just can't interrupt the speaker. Thank you very much. Those, those are our rules. Those are oh, oh, our rules. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. I thought you. No, she's asking. I got you. I got you. I got you. Um, <laughs> these kids are not wearing them correctly. A lot of the people aren't wearing them correctly. You're wearing a filter that you're touching all day long. You're taking it off. Most of you aren't storing it correctly. I know my kids, they get in my truck, they throw it on the seat. They throw it on their kitchen table, correct? You're bringing a filter that's full of all these germs with you. It'd be one thing if you're wearing it correctly. It still doesn't help, but it would be better if you were doing it correctly. You're not. You're doing more damage than good. You're better off not wearing the mask. I am fully vaccinated, have been tested over 300 times, and I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't wear it anywhere I go. Unless I absolutely have to, I don't wear it. And I have MS, I have diabetes. I'm in that category that should really be wearing, and I don't because I know the science. I work with these people every day. The masks are for you to feel better. They're not really doing what you think they're doing. And most of you aren't wearing N95s anyway, so they're really not doing anything. Those paper masks do zero. They protect nothing for, with this, this disease. And I've been looking around the room. I can't tell you how many of you people have touched your face with the mask on, including people on the board. There was a girl earlier. That's, you're gonna, you touch your face a thousand times, so when you get out of here and touch the mask, you're gonna touch your face. That's why this spread. And the gentleman is correct. This disease, the way it's running, is going to just stick around. It's not going to be as bad. It's going to end up being, I know it's not the same as the flu, but it's going to be acting like a flu. It's not going away, but it's not going to be as dangerous. You, you need to...
not listen to everything you hear on the TV. Don't let it be political. Don't let it be any of that. You need to read real facts. And if you look at real facts, which I am involved in every single day, 60 hours a week, you're better off not wearing your mask. And that's the truth. And now the state says schools should get rid of them, correct? Now, are you trying to tell me that the people in this room have more knowledge than what the state does? I don't think so. They have access to way more knowledge than any of us. And they're recommending you get rid of it. There's no reason to not follow suit. Trust me. That's what they think. That's what you should follow. We are not more intelligent than the intelligence that the state is getting. Thank you. Next. Hello. Um, my name's Amanda Capone. Um, I'm here for a few items, different items. One, um, I wanted to discuss last meeting um, when one of the people were talking and Renee was speaking in public comment, um, there was a point of order called by Mr. Tarallo. And um, when you guys looked at the school policy, what was handed to Mr. Frassica was the public participation at school committee meetings, which is the BEDH. And uh, Renee was speaking during public comment, which is B E D H slash E. And if you read that page, which wasn't provided to Ms. Afraska, it was the other page. It says individuals may address a topics on the agenda, items spe specified to, for public comment, or items within the scope of the responsibility of the school committee. So. I have sent many, three or four emails wanting to know the difference between public comment and public participation, why there's two different sections and why um, it was, the, the school committee allowed uh, Mr. Torello to call a point of order and stop her from speaking. This is censorship of the parents' free speech and it is a very slippery slope. As everybody here wants to speak, it, it's, I, I think that it was wrong. I think that it, um, what, what, what happened the other meeting was a mistake, I'm hoping, and I want that to be clarified that um, parents can continue to come here and speak during public comment on items within the scope of the duties of the school committee. Because I've enjoyed coming and I've enjoyed speaking and I would hate for that to be limited. Um, a second thing that I would, would like to speak on is um, I have sent um, a few requests um, asking for uh, the bonds that you all should have. Um, and I have gotten uh, replies from the city solicitor saying that you don't have bond, they don't have bonds or they don't exist or anything like that. So I'm here again to file another request for a copy of your, as let's see, page 105 of the Waltham School Committee Policy, file DH. Each employee of the school system who is assigned the responsibility of receiving and dispensing school funds will be bonded individually or covered by a blanket bond. The city will pay the cost of the bond. Legal reference, MGL 40, Five. So here is another a freedom of information request for a copy of that bond for whoever deals with the money. Um, the next thing was I requested your oaths of office. So when each one of you came into the school committee, you all had to take an oath of office. And your oath of office should be signed by you. I have received four copies of the oath of office. I guess the city solicitor is looking for a few more. Um, and all of you solemnly swore under oath that you would bear faith and allegiance to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and will support the Constitution therefore, thereof, so help me God. It goes on. You all took an oath 
to defend the Constitution of the United States of America. You all, this is 16 pages of constitutional violations masking children is. You all, we are American citizens, we are free people, and we deserve the right to live the way we want without illegal mandates being forced on our children. So here, if I could enter this into the... Next. Somebody next. Hello, I am Benjamin Herman. I live at Three Grant Place. I am a English teacher, an English teacher at Millis Middle School. And before I even became aware that Waltham was dealing with an issue regarding books and the banning thereof, I was teaching about communication and teaching about a very similar issue that happened down in the South, which I'm sure many people here are aware of. Now, I also do have a wealth of knowledge when it comes to GLBTQ issues, um, generally because I have a lot of friends who are, and I am surrounded by other people who are aware of the knowledge, and we are all able to share it. And we gained that knowledge not through word of mouth, but through looking it up, research. These are the types of things that we teach at school in the English class, in history class. So I had to attend one of many, many, um, it's called the PLC meeting. What that means, it's just the English department. It's me and four other English teachers. We eat chips and have chocolate and discuss which students are not doing well and how we can improve the curriculums. Uh, one way we are working to make the year a better year for all students, specifically for the English department, is we want to make reading a number one priority. We want to make reading better for everyone in the school. And so we as teachers read as much as we can. And we invoke that the students read whenever they're available to. I dedicate the first 15 minutes of every one of my classes to either journaling where kids can write whatever they want or to silent reading of whatever book they want. Now, very often I have students who have no idea what they want to read. I have students of all levels, some that truly don't have the ability to read, some that can't read in English. Middle school, I didn't give the grade, sixth grade. I hope that helps clear up things a bit. These students, if they find one single book that they like for any reason, specifically basketball for some students, they will share it with all their friends. And then all of a sudden, this student who wasn't a good reader becomes an amazing reader. He reads five other books. He runs out of the books in that series, those chapter books. He comes to the next level. He starts moving up and reading more books about his favorite types of activities. And myself as a teacher, I'm not that interested in basketball, but seeing a student go from reading a graphic novel to reading a light book to reading a chapter book within the course of like four weeks is absolutely amazing. And it's the main reason I went into teaching. Um, to be a bit more clear, I'm not quite a teacher yet. I am a student teacher, but I am developing the units. I'm writing the units, so it's all the same. I brought my Millis student staff badge, so it's the same. That didn't let me in the school. I still had to ask. Um, now, why do I talk about all these books? Obviously, we're on the docket talking about two specific books that are related to LGBTQ issues. And it is important 
that students have books that they can learn from and that are interesting to them. I think that they can use those books not just to learn about themselves and to learn about others, but to help them learn how to read. If we take away books that someone finds a connection with, if I were to take away those basketball books because I find basketball offensive for whatever reason, all of a sudden, those students aren't going to reach that high level of reading. I could probably go on for another couple hours about students and reading and how much I love it, but this was ad hoc, so thank you. Um, my name is Sebastian Gonzalez, um, a student at the Waltham High School. Um, I didn't have a speech for Penn. I just went up because I wanted to add my voice to everyone that says that this is an important issue. There's no reason to ban um, these two books unless you're trying to um, make things harder for LGBTQ plus people. Like, these books are completely beneficial to anyone that reads them looking for information. And so I think that it would just be a like a hostile act to like to ban them. Like it's just completely beneficial to keep them in. So I just wanted to say that. Anyone else wish, wish to speak? So I wasn't. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I wasn't going to speak, so I don't have anything prepared. So this is totally off the cuff. So I'm sorry if I'm not as coherent or eloquent as everyone else has been. Um, I could, you know, repeat wholeheartedly, like shout out from the rooftops, so many of the things that have been shared here tonight, like how important representation is, how important it is for our students to feel included and part of their community, no matter who they are. But like even more so bottom line, we send our students to public schools to be educated. And I think we're doing them a great disservice that they have to look to one book in a library to learn about different ways of being human. This is all part of being human. This is biology, this is life, this is psychology, sociology. Like we are meant to educate them and prepare them to be independent, you know, participating adults, respecting themselves and each other in their communities. And I don't, I think it, these things should be taught in the curriculum and not just a book. I think it's ridiculous that we are sending our students out uneducated and unprepared in something that is such a crucial part of being a human for the vast majority of people. Um, I also wanted to say to all the students that were speaking, darn, you guys, <laughs> I'm like so proud of you. I think these students, to me, they came up here, they spoke before, the, before all of these adults in the community, before their parents, before their peers, before the school committee, not just advocating for themselves, but advocating for each other and advocating for other people in their community. And that to me says that the educators in our school are doing a darn good job because those are exactly the kinds of skills these kids need. So that's all. I'm proud of you guys. Anyone else? I have a question. Yes. Am I allowed to comment on anything that was said before me? You're allowed to come up and speak usually only once. Okay. But if you're the last one to speak, I'll allow you. Okay. Is anybody else going to speak? I need to know. Because mm -hmm. you'd be on the second time around. Okay? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so wait one minute. Wait one minute. Someone else is going to speak on the first time around. Okay. Nope. Second time. Second time around. Okay, wait a minute. Hold on. What are you? This first time around? I haven't spoken at all. You haven't talked at all. You get to come first then. Okay, thank you. I had no intentions. Hi, I'm Tammy Lake. Um, I live at 34 Harvard Street in Waltham. 
I'm going to get a little emotional because I'm going to talk about something that's very difficult. Consent is a very important thing to teach kids. I was never taught it. I was sexually abused when I was very young, and I was raped again when I was an adult because I didn't understand this, the things to do to have a normal relationship. The kids that you're taking me that might not have the information of how to have a healthy relationship will be vulnerable like I was. <laughs> they will be at risk of having those things happen to them. And that should not happen. We should be protecting them. And education is how you protect them. Letting them know what they can, what they can say, what they can do, how they can handle different situations. That is how you protect them. If you take away information, you leave them fighting in the dark. And then they end up being vulnerable. And when they are vulnerable, there are predators who will take advantage of them because that is what predators do. And that is, that is what they look for. So I just am sitting here listening to this and it just, I kept, sorry. <laughs> but this is important. It's important to teach them and to let them have the information about how to have conversations and have healthy relationships and how to know how to say yes and no because otherwise it, it can happen to them and we don't want that to happen to our kids, okay? Thank you. Uh, anyone else on the first time around? My community speaks. Okay. Now, Nobody on the first. How many want to speak again? Because it's very unusual for me to grant this. But I will do it. Where's the young lady right here, right? May, you may be opening a can of worms, though, because if you let her rebuttal, then other people are going to want to rebuttal. Listen. <laughs> I mean, that's We're the truth. We're not allowed to speak back, okay? okay. But in fairness, yep. I've been very open with that. But you're opening a can of worms. Well, first, may I ask, am I allowed to comment back on what anybody has said before me? Normally, the rule is you cannot speak again. Okay. Okay, that's the rule. Okay. Now, if I say to the school committee, do you wish to suspend the rule to do that? How many people want to speak again? I just want to know. Two? Two seconds. It okay. depends on what she says. Hold on for a minute. Okay. Now, the only way I can do this is if we vote to suspend the rule. Okay, is the motion to suspend the rule to allow these two individuals to talk? So moved. So moved by Mrs. Gately. A second. Second. Second by Ms. Donnelly? Yes. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed, the ayes have. Okay, go ahead. Since I was allowed. Uh, just, just remember, mm -hmm. you address the comments to me. I'm okay. the chair. You can't address it to somebody individual, but the comments to me. Only because that's how. So why was work. I addressed individually by this man right here? I don't, I don't work for the school committee. You said, you said, but she okay. was allowed. I don't work for the you, school committee. Stop. You, that one, that's enough. Stop. She has the floor. You need to address them to me. Okay. You can say, but you can't have it engaged with this. Okay. Okay, so just address your comments to me. I will. All right. All right. I will make it as general as possible. <clears throat> when we say that we are relying on the state to make our rules because they know better, well, the state said anybody that is vaccinated can walk into a store and not have their mask on. And then people were like, well, if, well, why did the COVID surge have most people that had the vaccine already? Well, you told us to take our masks off and the vaccine wasn't there to prevent co from us getting COVID. It was there for us to stay safe when we do have COVID. Second thing, if, we are being, if you are taking the time to educate yourself about the sciences behind these, these um, viruses, then you can take the time to educate about, about yourself about the LGBTQ community. That is all I had to say.
you can take your time to educate yourself on all the topics that we have on the forum. Thank you. Okay, now last speaker. I want to make something clear that when I made my statement about the book, it was only about that book. I never said that any other books should be taken out of that or any anything, any resources should be taken away. Again, I have family members that are gay, okay? And you may not think that because I'm here, but even those members found this to be too much. Again, I never said to take anything away from the libraries where the resources are so everyone can learn. That had nothing to do with it. It has to do with a book that shows pictures that should not be seen by children. Now, you want to you wanna go? This book has to do with everybody. Hey, come on. Hey. You now, want... Listen to me carefully. I specifically asked if anybody else had wanted an opportunity to speak. So the rule here is when I give up this opportunity to someone, nobody else is supposed to speak. That's the rule. Because the chair is giving the person at that microphone the ability to speak. Okay? Everybody got that? All right? Okay. Go ahead, please. If they want to reference to that book, they can go to the Little Queer Library. They can go get it anywhere they want to get. They don't have to get it from the Waltham Public School. That is, you can, there's a, there are other resources where you can get the book. You can buy the book. I bought the book off Amazon. So you don't have to go to the library to get it, and it doesn't have to be in the hands of little children. Because the book will go home, the book will go home and get into the hands of somebody younger. And if you say the book keeps going out, well, of course it's going out. That's curiosity from some people, because I know a few people that, that's how I found out about it. A couple of boys being curious to see what was in the book. So that's what brings us here. Again, it's not about taking away resources. It's about taking that book off the shelves of the public library. Thank you. And I also want you to know that I got mauled out here, ran over by somebody, and she's here somewhere. There's no reason for anybody to be angry at me. I'm able to speak what I want to say without being plowed down by somebody. Thank you. Okay. Now. Next item. Student council, student input. Anyone from the student council or student input wish to speak? <clears throat> Uh, hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, to address things that, that have been going on in the school, uh, this past Valentine's Day was a huge success as the junior class organized candy grams for the students to give each other. Not only that, but dance theater is putting on their performances over the next few days, so we're expecting a good turnout for those as well. And with the spring musical auditions coming up for Newsies, we're looking forward to a great rest of our spring. Um, this Friday, the National Honor Society will be, having, will be hosting a canned food drive and encourage anyone who is able to donate. Um, also, about at 6 o'clock today, I, along with the rest of the Waltham Weston combined ski, um, cross-country ski team, returned with the team winning fourth place in the states. And also, um, the, on Friday, the progress reports will be sent out to all families. Thank you. Okay. Next item, student, school council, excuse me, PTO, CPAC, bell pack input. I think there was a PTO. Yes. Yes, over here, okay, good. This one? You can okay. go. You can go. Good evening. My name is Susan Bingham. I'm a former high school biology teacher. I hold a master's degree in educational psychology and I'm co-chair of the high school PTO. Members of the school committee may recall the results of the most recent youth risk behavior survey conducted of Waltham youth, but I'm gonna summarize the parts salient to this discussion for everyone else. Of the approximately 1,650 students at the high school, 678 students responded. 
Of those, fewer than 13 students reported that they identify as transgender. Approximately 33 said they, they identified as non-binary or gender expansive. And a full 25% or approximately 170 students identified as LGBTQ. For those curious, the numbers of members who've already self-identified as members of this community at the middle school level are even higher. There, 8% identified as non-binary gender expansive compared to 5% at the high school, and a full 30% identifies LGBTQ compared to 25% at WHS. Clearly, we can expect the number of students who identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community at Waltham High School to be larger in the future. The survey also showed us that the LGBTQ plus population at Waltham High School reported being at greater risk than all other identified populations. In the LGBTQ plus community, nearly twice as many students reported severe stress. Twice as many gay and bi students report depression compared to heterosexual students, and they are three times as likely to be bullied. They are also more likely to abuse alcohol and drugs than other school populations. Their mental health needs are not being addressed, and we need to work on greater understanding and acceptance of LGBTQ students in our broader community. If that wasn't enough, our LGBTQ students are among our most sexually active and sexually victimized. Our LGBTQ students are 20% more likely to engage in sexual activity than are their heterosexual counterparts, and they are three times more likely to be victims of dating and sexual violence. As regards the issue before us this evening, they need more support to address their sexual, sexuality, sexual health, and relationship needs, not fewer. From the number of students reporting as being members of the community and the issues they deal with, you would think that the GSA would be huge, but it isn't. It's generally about 15 students providing support to one another. They have community and they have pride. What they and the hundreds of other students in our school's LGBTQ community clearly don't have yet is justice. And I thank Renee Arena for bringing this issue to our attention, sincerely. Obviously, available library selections are only part of what needs working on, but they are what we're here to discuss tonight. I have read both of the books in question and have looked at the broader collection of books on sex, gender, and sexuality available at the Waltham School Library. I support the library's decision to get a more updated version of the book, This is Gay, and I found Gender Queer to be an outstanding book. I found that there are fewer than 20 books on sex, gender identity, and sexuality in our high school's collection, and that includes heterosexuality. And I understand that there are only about 40 books in the entire 1,500 volume library collection specifically on LGBTQ issues. While a solid number of them are excellent, there are a significant majority, like the version of This Book is Gay in discussion, that are grossly out of date. Only one book in the entire sexuality section is in Spanish. None of the volumes in the nonfiction section address sexuality, gender identity, and sexual and relationship health in an intersectional manner. To that end, I am proud to announce that the Waltham High School PTO is starting a fundraiser to help our truly excellent library staff to expand upon the offerings related to sexuality, gender identity, and sexual relationship health in the high school library. These will address the needs of our cisgendered, heterosexual, and LBTQ students alike, and will include materials pertaining to our students of color, those with disabilities, those who are neurodiverse, and those who are recent immigrants to our country. Checks can be made out to Waltham High School Library with library written in the memo, and my fellow co-chairs and I are happy to receive your donations tonight or at any time in the future. We are grateful to the teachers and staff of Waltham Schools for working to create a safer community for all of our students, and to the assembled community for coming and speaking tonight, and to the committee for its time and attention to this important issue. I thank you. Okay. Now, that closes all of the public hearings. Next item. Consent agenda. Mayor, would you, would you consider um, asking the committee about item 7A? We have several staff members here tonight to give a presentation under that agenda item, and I don't know if the committee would consider moving that item up. So agenda. moved. So moved by Mr. Tarallo. Second. Second by who? Me. Mrs. Aldemar. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed, the ayes have it. Thank you very much, I appreciate we'll that. We'll move 7 I, 7A, middle school, Schedule update. Perfect timing to sign out, Ms. Kent, sorry. The lights are off again. So is Eddie around? Eddie Biddy around? Up oh, the back on. So I'm gonna introduce our assistant superintendent for teaching and learning, Sarah Kent, who's gonna start this presentation. We have 
several members of a committee that have been working for the past few months on looking at a refresh of our middle school schedule. And Ms. Kent will start us off and then turn it over to other members of the committee. Mayor McCarthy, school committee members, Dr. Regan, Mrs. Landry. Um, we are here tonight to share with you some exciting work that the middle school team has been doing around their schedule for next school year. As uh, Dr. Regan just mentioned, we had a very diverse committee of about 21 members who all were, had started this work back in, the, in October, and we've met several times along the way and had a lot of work in between those meetings as well. So instead of introducing them all or reading the slide to you, several of them are here tonight and have stayed through our public comment session to support this initiative. And I just ask that those of the who are on the committee would just stand. We have teachers, building administrators, directors, and central office folks who all contributed to this. It was a wonderful team and I was honored to facilitate it. We started our process with goal setting. What did we want to achieve by looking at our schedule? And we did that through data analysis and then prioritization. We came up with four goals. As you know, it's very difficult to have a schedule that meets all your goals. Um, it's always trade-offs. But our four goals included flexibility to increase access to different courses and supports for our students, to su support social-emotional learning, to include choice, and to value teacher collaboration time. In the background of this, we also we all are realized and are aware that dual language is extending up into Kennedy Middle School next year. We wanted to make sure that this would fit that as well. Once we established our goals, we had a, a survey to all middle school staff to get their input on these goals. You can see the questions there, I won't read them to you. But staff members filled this out during meeting time and we looked through patterns and trends and found good ideas. We also, instead of reinventing the wheel, looked at about 10 other districts, scheduled middle school schedules, who had components that would support our goals. I'm going to introduce uh, Mike Saban, principal of the McDevitt, to start and explain the first part of our refresh. Thank you, Sarah. Good evening. I will be sharing an overview of the proposed schedule refresh, and Kennedy Assistant Principal Adrian Norris will illustrate these adjustments with a few sample schedules. I should just start by saying we're really excited that this updated schedule will improve both of our middle schools. The chart you see in front of you illustrates the primary changes, detailing their benefits and some trade-offs. Going in order from the top, we will be introducing a weekly social emotional learning block which Kevin Gilday, Heather Medalides, and Jamie Wakefield will explore more in a few minutes. Our world language program will be extended downwards into grade six. Math and English language arts in grade six will now meet for one block per day. The double periods and workshop periods currently in the schedule have been replaced by more targeted supports. ESL classes at all grade levels will meet either four times per cycle or 10 times per cycle, depending on student language needs. The ELA and math intervention program will be expanded and extended to grade six, making extra academic support available at all grade levels. And health class will now meet twice per cycle for half the year rather than once per cycle for the whole year. It might be a bit hard to make sense of those changes when hearing about it for the first time or looking at them in that chart. So just to, to summarize, from the angle of our core ac academics, what we call MESH in Waltham, math, English, science, and history, continuity is the main takeaway. These MESH classes at all three grade levels in both schools will continue to meet for one full period every day. 
Our teacher teams will continue to work together as clusters or grade level curriculum groups at both schools and our class sizes will remain small as they are. Yeah. The curriculum will remain the same. Most of the schedule adjustments are in the FAPA or the Fine and Performing Arts area and Practical Arts. The new FAPA schedule has increased flexibility with classes meeting either two times or four times per cycle. Students will experience a balance of wellness, academics, and arts. Students in need of extra support in literacy or math can access the help needed at all grade levels. Students will also benefit from the addition of world language in grade six, and a new FAPA class will be created and added at each grade level. I will now pass the mic to Adrienne Norris, who will share some sample schedules. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I have three sample schedules for you today to illustrate how these changes look visually. For seventh and eighth grade, the first schedule that's here, there's very little change. You'll see we're still operating on our six day cycle and every student will have math, English, science, and history each day. The new piece is our additional SEL block. That will be fixed on Thursdays. And you'll hear more about that in a couple minutes. We also have an additional FAPA offering. So if you look at the schedule, you'll see every day the students will have a class that deals with the arts in our FAPA, such as theater, music, art, tech ed, or health or, or gym. The real enhancements to the schedule come within the sixth grade. We now have the opportunity to offer world language to all of our sixth grade students. You'll notice that we still have the SEL block here for these gr this group as well, and an additional FAPA option. So our students will see their MESH teachers, math, English, science, and history every day, have the option for a world language, and have an art and wellness option every day. We do recognize that we have students that need more targeted intervention. So we do have an option, here's a sixth grade sample, where this student would be receiving interventions with an ELA and math. This is just one sample. The student, we may have students that only need targeted instruction in ELA or only in math, but we do have now the capacity to offer both and still allow these students to take FAPA classes. We are maintaining our core academics and access to interventions and fine arts, practical arts and wellness classes, which meets our original goal of access for all students. We're very excited about the SEL block, which is in each schedule, and I'm going to turn it over now to Mr. Kevin Gilday, who will tell you more about that. Committee members, Dr. Regan, Ms. Landry. Tonight I'm very pleased to present Part B, Part B of our Schedule Refresh Plan. The mo one of the most significant development of our team's work has been the creation of the SEL or the Social Emotional Learning Block. But tonight's purpose is I'm going to refer to this as our SEL block. In the fall, we plan to have the students help us name this really important time. Uh, time. Tonight, with the help of some of our uh, committee members, we plan to share the following information. The structure and vision of the SEL block, the benefits of SEL work at the school, the alignment of SEL with both the district and the middle school improvement plans, data supporting the need for additional SEL work, and then examples of ongoing work to support SEL. This block will take place the first 35 minutes of every Thursday morning. For the rest of the day, each block will be shortened by five minutes to accommodate for the uh, morning SEL block. As a result of our student survey that Ms. Kent spoke about, next year we'll only have one block per week. In the following school year, we hope to expand to two blocks per week. Speaking of the staff survey, our SEL block was overwhelmingly supported by staff with support and training, which we are in process of developing. This slide here showed the many different benefits of social-emotional learning. 
improves academic performance, teacher responsible, uh, teacher's responsibility decision making, improves confidence, teaches coping skills, encourages empathy. The list goes on. This next slide shows how the SEL block will support the middle school improvement plan as well as increase achievement. The top uh, bulleted information is taken from our district-wide strategic plan about developing SEL goals and so forth. The district, the SEL district learning team as well will have a multidisciplinary team working together. They have been working together for the past four years to finalize the district uh, learning plan for SEL and I think Ms. Uh, Willett will be presenting some of that information in the next few weeks. In addition, the SEL blocks uh, will support both of the school improvement plan and instructional priorities at the middle school. You can see an example of uh, McDevitt uh, school improvement plan, school improvement plan, uh, as well as the Kennedy's uh, instructional priority. At the bottom, we talk a little bit about how if SEL uh, interventions are addressed, the five competencies, which we will share um, at later, Ms. Wakefield will share that, will increase the student's academic performance by 11 percentile points compared to students who do not participate. Now I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Uh, uh, Heather Metalides, our PE and Health Wellness Director, to share some of the recent data that supports the need for structured SEL blocks. Good evening, everyone. So you've heard about the benefits of SEL, social emotional learning, and that our schools have focused their goals around this work. But I'd like to peel this back a little bit and share with you the why. The alarming data that you see on this screen is data from our students in the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. It's very clear through this data that you see on the screen, as well as panorama data that our students need social, emotional, and mental health support. The kids are asking for it. Also, we know that scientific evidence confirms that programs that teach adolescents effective ways to deal with stressful life circumstances can prevent the development of clinical depression. This de dedicated social-emotional learning block is just one important approach to social-emotional learning. There are other approaches that are happening through explicit lessons in our health and our physical education classes, embedded SEL skill instruction in all classes, general best teaching practices in all classes, and school-wide approaches to positive school culture and climate. And Jamie Wakefield will come up and speak a little bit about the deeper things that are happening at each school. Good evening. As you've heard, we are hoping to add a social emotional learning block to our schedule proposal. I also wanted to highlight our ongoing work in social emotional learning right now. Currently, we have over 35 educators who are being trained in restorative circles. And they will also be able to train others at their respective schools. We also wanted to highlight that at both middle schools, students are participating in community building activities daily, such as monthly Mustang meetups and the Kennedy Kindness Projects. At each building, students are participating in activities that focus on self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. I'm now going to turn this presentation back over to Sarah Kent to summarize our schedule plan. Hello again. As you can see, this has been a really collaborative and exciting work that the middle school team has taken on together. There are about, I think, 12 of the team here tonight, which shows their dedication and excitement about this. There are, just to summarize where we've come through, um, the schedule itself is not extremely different from where it was before. There are a couple of tweaks that we're adding in order to improve the experience of our middle school students. It worked towards the goals of supporting social emotional learning and the flexibility to increase access of different classes for students. It adds the SEL block once a week with room to expand to two the following year or whenever we feel we are ready. It also includes increased access to courses, as we've talked about the Spanish language arts for dual language students, 
world language in grade six, more targeted interventions for students who need them, an additional course in all three grades. The structure also does contain the ability to offer student choice in the future. So if we can get you know, down the road, this would allow us to go there without changing much. At this time, the team would be happy to answer any of your questions that you may have. I'll, be, I'll direct them to the correct member of our team. This is Al Jamal, you for us, please. Uh, thank you for that presentation. I do have a couple of questions. Um, how much structured in, uh, time, learning time, are we going to be losing by adding that SCL block? So, as far as the state is concerned and time on learning, we're not losing any. In that SEL, the SEL block would be a curriculum-based time that would count for time on learning just like any other class. So as far as like on the books minutes on learning, we're not losing anything. Is that what you're, is that what you're asking me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm really happy to see the world languages going into the sixth grade. I think the earlier we start any new language is fantastic. I would love to see it in the elementary school if we could pull that off. Um, but is there any concern that getting rid of one block is going to impede progress in learning another language? I know learn, oh, with languages, I if you don't use it, yeah. you lose it, right? So, so we're losing a block yeah. in seventh and eighth grade. Yeah, so Cynthia's here, but I'll try, Cynthia, and you can always chime in. Um, so currently, they have world language for five blocks in grades seven and eight. And they would now have four blocks in six, seven, and eight. So in reality, over the course of a middle school career, it's actually more time. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's three years versus two. So I believe, did I represent that well? Okay. <laughs> um, um, I believe it's actually an added benefit for language learning. So with the new schedule, with the introduction of the world language in sixth grade, if a student requires that targeted intervention so that they have ELA lab or math lab, they're losing that world language block. Is that correct? That is correct. So if a student needs that extra intervention in sixth grade, but by seventh and eighth grade they don't, mm -hmm. what happens? Can they pick up that world language at that point, or are they not going to be able to because <laughs> they didn't get it from the beginning? Sorry, I don't mean to. You've had a lot of people talking in the background, so I apologize for that. Um, yes, the answer, the short answer is yes, you can do that. Currently, we have seventh and eighth graders who have similar situations. So seventh grade who might complete all the lab requirements, and they're ready to move, and they can begin get introduced to this language in eighth grade now. This model actually creates a better benefit. At the end of the two years, they're going to, ideally they're going to go into language two. If we get these interventions in place by sixth grade and they're ready to move out of that intervention block, well, I'm confident that with our current uh, model with seventh and eighth grade, they're still going to be able to get into language two. Where currently, if they, if they only jump into the language in eighth grade, they would really need to go back into language one. And usually we just, uh, it's, it's a class that surveyed and they have a pass fail on that in eighth grade. We'll be able to institute grades from seven to eight and it'll be almost very similar to what we currently do now, but as you mentioned, it's, it's four meeting times versus five. Okay. One other question, these sample schedules. So it looks like that first block after homeroom, math, social studies, math, social studies, math, social studies. Why don't we have the same class the same time every day. Well, Why are it, we yeah, flipping well, it around? There's two different ways to do it. They call it bandit and waterfall. Um, and I think anyone who's experienced that, sometimes having that same class, the last period every single day can be a challenge. Having that water, it's been, recommend, it's been uh, brought to us, the teachers are laughing, I'm sorry. 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 <laughs> they, teachers have made it very clear to us that having a waterfall is the preferred way of doing it. During, when we were in remote and we had WSO, we did have a little bit of that bandit opportunity because we had essentially three schools that had to align, McDevitt, WSO, and then Kennedy. Mm -hmm. We have the autonomy now to create this waterfall, so you don't have that, and, and it's a struggle. And it's not just a teacher thing, to be honest with you. Uh, if we have a situation where, um, for example, say my preferred class is not science and I have a first period, well, I'm gonna come in at nine o'clock. 
and I'm going to make sure I miss science every single day, and it's not going to affect the rest of my day. There's other ways to address it other than scheduling, but that is one way that we want to make sure that there's a little bit more of a balance of how we move through the scheduling. Okay, thank you. Yep. I also, can I just add, having, being the mother of a teenager, that first block also is tough to get them to participate well in. Yeah. This is Coleman. Um, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Um, Liz actually asked the majority of the questions that I had. Um, I think introducing the language at sixth grade is an absolutely wonderful idea, and the longer that they can be exposed to that and the earlier, the better. Um, will they have a choice in language mm -hmm. at this point? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, they, they would be able, as sixth graders, to choose into which language they would like to study. Great. Thank you. Mr. Torello, next. Thank you guys for all the work that you're doing, all the work that you've done and continue to do to help make our, our students day the best it can be. Um, with the schedule the way it is, if I'm a student who needs a learning center because I'm on an IEP, am I going to have the choice between either taking a language or taking um, an art class or a health class? How does that work? In the proposed schedule? Yes. Mr. Saban, you want to answer that? So, thank you. Um, of course, short of extending the school day, there always have to be some scheduling trade-offs when we add in help of any kind. Uh, what we like, one of the things we like in the current schedule is that by having all classes two periods or four periods in that FAPA block, there are more options for students. So students who have received some sort of special education services during that time have always had to give up some number of other options, world language or FAPA. In this schedule, we believe there's at least one more class they'll be able to take while still getting their services. So they will be sacrificing something in exchange for those services, but they will have an increase in options over what they currently have. Okay. So more specifically, I, I know they have to give up something. When I was um, going through school, I had to give up my, my FAPA classes. But now that we have the option of the language or and FAPAs, are they going to get the opportunity to choose which one's better for them? Or is it you're either going to take the language, like everyone's taking the language, so it's going to be the, the FAPA classes or are they going to have the ability to, you know, forgo the language at this stage and do the FAPA? I just want to make sure that that's yeah. An so um, we'll have to play out all the options. The language being four periods is harder to fit in than a two-period class would be. But I think we would have to look at each individual scenario. There there are twelve periods in that FAPA block, and if four were taken up for a structured reading, say two for PE and some for health, there, there are sufficient periods available to take a world language, but then a lot of other things would be given up. So we will plan to offer families some choices there. That's great. Um, in terms of the length of the blocks, how long are the blocks going to be in the new schedule? So as you know, our traditional blocks have been 57 minutes. They were then shortened over the last two years to add in times for breaks and some of the complications of lunch uh, during COVID time. So they were shortened more to 52 to 55 minutes. Um, I don't think all of those minutes have been completely resolved yet for next year. There's variables we're not sure of, and we have to figure out the exact passing time between periods, which has generally been three minutes, but could be shortened slightly. But it will be somewhere between 50 and 60 minutes will be the time length of the classes. And on the day of advisory, there'll be five minutes or excuse me, of the social emotional learning block, they'll be five minutes shorter. Okay. Um, so recently we received some letters from students from Kennedy School. Um, some of them spoke about wanting, at least two of them spoke about wanting um, some sort of half day like the high school has. Was that considered anywhere in, in your deliberations? <laughs> I'll, I'll defer to my better half here for answering that one. 
I, I believe Ms. Corey is here. I would imagine they may, may have come from her class. Uh, it was a it was an activity about writing persuasive essays. I know that uh, Dr. Regan responded to some kids. I got very passionate letters about wearing hats in school. Uh, and it was a w wide range of them. And I'm sure they talked about um, the, the half a day model. And that's something, obviously, that we, we could explore. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how it is uh, laid out here at the middle, at the high school. Um, we are able to, I, I believe, some of that time is dedicated for CPT. We are, because of the team and the model that we have at the middle school, we are able to embed our CPT times during, um, right now currently, the, the Kennedy has all their CPT times on day one, and McDevitt has on day three. So we are able to embrace that type of time within the school day. But if you folks want to move to a half a day, I'm sure you're going to have a bunch of happy kids out in Waltham tonight. <laughs> I, I, I joke, just, I apologize. No, no, it's fine. I just think it's important when, when kids are voicing their opinion that we, we take it into consideration. We look at what they're saying and, and see if it's possible as we're, we're at this crossroads where we're, we're designing a new schedule. Um, that's, that was the only reason why. I, I, I agree with you. I appreciate the voice and I appreciate the work that Ms. Corey does, uh, pulling the kid's voice out and challenging them. Uh, she does put that caveat that not everything's going to be answered or agreed to, uh, but I, do, I still think it's a really worthwhile exercise that the kids go through to perfect their writing uh, skills that they're working on. If I can just add one thing around that topic. I know I received letters from students yeah. specifically about SEL. Uh, they wanted blocks to help with their social emotional learning, their mental health. And when I read that, I was thinking, oh, that's great because we've checked that box, uh, I think, really well in this new schedule. So, um, again, we can't meet everybody's request, but it was nice to know that this was something that students felt passionate about and that we're able to, you know, if we go forward with the schedule, we're able to, to show them that we also agree with them and that you give them something that they're looking for to help them. So, I just and, and I would only add the students know they need help. And it's out there. And we, I've come up here before and have spoken about this need of ha establishing a really strong foundation of SEL in order to deliver that high quality education that I, uh, we're confident both schools are able to do. No, and, and without question, it, it's something that's important and much needed in our, in our schools. Um, and I appreciate all the work that you guys are doing and the, the work that you've done. Um, and it's just important to talk about what what our students are saying. Just make sure they, uh, they know that they're mentioned tonight. <laughs> I know I haven't responded to, I haven't responded to all of their, their letters, but I think it's important that, you know, I've, I've read them and put it forward for them. Thank you. Anybody else? Mrs. Gately, I'm sorry. I, w I would just say that I'm, I'm very impressed about how both of the middle schools have work together to make it uh, seem to be a very, very, very good new schedule. Um, uh, I've always thought that the middle school is, is the most, one of the most challenging places for you all to be working and teaching. There's uh, lots of things that are going on. Kids are growing and developing in all different ways. And uh, it's just nice to see the two schools get together and communicate, work together and put something together. I'm particularly happy about the SEL period. I think that's really important for that age group of kids. And uh, great that the world language is going into sixth grade. So congratulations and thank you for your hard work. Ms. Donnelly, then Mr. Fresco. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, this, the schedule is amazing. I think I'd have a hard time following it now. <laughs> It was a period of time for about three or four years that I did teach middle school. And I mean, uh, yes, it was then sixth, seventh, and eighth. And it all had to do with how many fit in the building, you know, because the, um, no, excuse me, the eighth moved to the high school. The high school had been built and had extra room in it, you know. So it was really hard for me to get the kids onto their schedules when I had a hard time following those schedules, you know. And then the more, so, so I see the amount of uh, subjects that they have, especially in the past, there, there weren't as many periods of language, you know. So, um, well, uh, good luck. I think I'll come someday <laughs> next You're year. You're always, always welcome. Follow people around and see what the schedule is. I, I know that one of the most nerve-wracking things for the students were when they came from um, like a pretty much of a single classroom situation 
was having all the books and wondering where they go. Well, if you do come visit, I'm sure you'll see in both buildings, they, most of them have a binder, and in the front sleeve on that front is their schedule. You know, so they're very well organized. Um, middle school is about organization and learning how to learn as well. So. Yes, yes, but thank you anyway. It, uh, I definitely will. I mean, they even have drama here. Mm -hmm. We have drama down in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello, yes, yes, good drama. Tears when I can't find my schedule. Or, are they, tell me, are the students using their lockers at all now? They are. Because that's always been something in the high school. They tend not to use them, and, but they are in the middle school, so they can just stop and pick up what they need or drop off stuff. Yeah, okay, thank you. Mr. Frasca. Thank you. So I'm not going to complain that the only language I saw up there was Italian, but <laughs> what, are the, what are the other languages that are being offered in the middle school, please? So we have Spanish, Italian, French, that's okay. okay. Just so I want, I just wanted to know. Um, uh, Mr. Sabin mentioned something about um, you know you'll have to figure that out as the time goes on. With, with the question of Mr. Terrell, I think it was Mr. Terrell. When do you think that would be? I mean, to, to, when would the figuring out part be happening? Because this hasn't even kicked in yet. So I think this schedule. One of the things we like about this schedule is that it can evolve over time. The current schedule has different classes that might meet five times every six days, three times, two times, one time. It's a puzzle that locks together and has almost no flexibility. And sometimes kids are tracked into classes with the same set of kids across their schedule because it's so interconnected. And that limits students' choices and it limits our choices. So what we like about this schedule is that everything's in twos and fours, it's much more flexible, and it will offer a lot of choice. We're not accustomed to giving that much choice in middle school compared to high school, so this is something that we'll be learning. We anticipate in keeping that choice fairly limited in our first year of the new schedule. But students will be, who, the main form of choice is students who have an academic intervention of some kind, could be ESL, special education, or one of our intervention classes, they can't take everything else. So we wanna offer those students some choices so the things they want to take most, say drama or art, they'll get a chance to do that. We don't want students to feel that it's a punishment to get the extra academic support that they might need. Right. And one of the ways to do that is to ensure that they get their most preferred other classes. Okay. And that we'll be doing for next year. Very good. I know Mr. Tarallo asked that question also about special education. I had that down here myself. What do you feel, in anybody, what do you feel you've gained from this and what do you think you might have lost from this? Is there anything on either side? Uh, I'm sure the game part, because you all worked on this, but what's, <laughs> do you feel like you might have lost something that you said, oh, I wish we could have kept that in the loop? You want to take that, Kevin? Sure. Okay. I, I was waiting for Ms. Norris, if you should, it's up to you. All right. <laughs> um, to be perfectly honest, I don't think we lost anything. Okay. Um, and I know to say, you know, it's kind of like, what's your, what's your weakness? So oh, I work too hard. Um, I really don't think we lost. What I think is important is we gained a lot of continuity in, in the schedule itself. It makes sense how to do this. The targeted intervention is a key component to address the students in all areas. We've talked, as I mentioned earlier, we've come and we've talked about the need of this SEL. I can't overemphasize, if that's not done well, other things fall off the table. So it's essential that we have a dedicated block and we're telling the students, we're telling the community, we're telling our parents, it has a home. It has a home and that trumps all the benefits, I think in a lot of ways, that we've dedicated a home, uh, we're not reliant on things to happen to happen. It's gonna be scheduled, it's gonna be curriculum based, it's gonna be trained and it has a home and it has a home that can expand. So I ask this all the time when something changes, and I think I've just... Well, I think the biggest downside is, uh, excuse me, no, that's is okay. that's okay. change. Change is the biggest thing, the drawback. No one, I think teachers in particular, as I was a teacher, you love routine. You know when those kids are coming in, whether it's a bandit or waterfall, you know when it is, change is unnerving. We've gone through two years of unpredictability. So that's gonna be met with some of that, but I do think when we get this behind us, we begin, as Mr. Savis said, sorting out those different things, 
we're going to look back and say this was a really good move for our kids, most importantly, and I think our teachers are going to benefit from it as so well. So you bring up a good point, though, Mr. Gilday. Was this the, the, the best time to do it because of what we've dealt with for two years, or is this, you know, now we've got to do this. Let's do it before we really all start to get back into the swing. Well, Ms. Kent will tell you I've, I've talked about this for a little while. Okay. Um, I think the time is optimal. While. I think the time is optimal to do it now. Very good. Uh, final, I guess, question. And again, this is what I said earlier. I, I start to ask these questions. I ask it all the time something changes. Are we going to keep an eye on it that if we have to tweak something here and there, and not just what you know, Mr. Saban was talking about, but that we have to do something to keep it going straight, yeah. will that be what? Yes. Because I always get concerned that if it doesn't, then we yeah. forget. You know, yeah, so. and I think that that's one of the things about the flexibility that is so good. If we've got something that's off or some group that's not getting their meet, needs met or something is happening, we, we can flex and twist. Can I just add one thing that I think we gained? Please. It was great teamwork across two buildings. Mm -hmm. Across? Across two buildings. Across As two buildings. As you saw tonight, you know, the, they had some wonderful discussions about kids, what kids need, and how to meet the kids' needs that were really great. Everybody shaking their head yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Everybody else said? Okay, thank you for all your work because I know you're trying to meet the needs of the children, all children. Tonight we heard how we don't meet the needs of kids. And I think it's important, you know, we've always had a human maturation course, fourth and fifth grade. Middle school is a key, critical time for children. And I think these will provide more resources in the classroom as part of the curriculum to address the needs of all children. So thank you very much for all your work. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Chair declares a five minute recess so everybody can go to the bathroom if they wish. <laughs>